will happen. Oh. It will happen. Can we turn down these the volume of these TV just so it will go away? They thank you very much. Let's go back to the ping pong. Wait a second. How many of you play ping pong here? Yeah, just a few. Okay. This is just a small story. So anyway, so I I get to the set and the guy, you know, he's nervous. He hasn't. He's on a movie set. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. And I played some ping pong a little bit, like everybody. So I said, I tell you what, why don't we just hit some balls? You know, <laughs> so I'm playing ping pong with the South Korean champion, but not really <laughs> playing, just trying to hit the ball over the the thing. And since Forrest was supposed to play like a, a master ping pong player, we didn't have a ball. It was all imaginary. So the one guy would swing and act like he was hitting the ball, and then Tom would hit the ball. And they just do this play acting. So Tom gets out there, and he says, OK, let's start. And he says, OK, I'm going to hit, then you hit. So let's just start. So it's like this guy. He just doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know, like, do I hit it now? Wait a second. He's immediately out of the cadence as if he was hitting the ball properly. So we we put a uh, a click track. So every time the first Tom said, "I hit, you hit," and he'd say this vocally. He'd say, "I hit, you hit, I hit, you hit." Dancing then, basically. So then we got a click track where we actually put a sound into the set would go tick tock tick tock would be hit hit each guy would alternate click he couldn't do it he couldn't stay in sync so Tom said okay look Bob just get away this is what we're gonna do every time he hits I'll act like I'm just hitting and he can just swing and I'll just react to him and so the whole time that's how we did the whole thing is just Tom reacting to this guy had no idea how to hit an imaginary ball so that's my ping pong. <laughs> and, and, and this is a perfect. This is what you end up having to do on movies. You know, you got a great plan, then you go to plan B, and then it all falls apart and you just make it work somehow. And, and this is a perfect way to start because, you know, we, we think about filmmaking, you know, and there is all the pressure of getting a production started. Uh, casting, but also, you know, getting a crew ready for a production. And in the end of the day, what we're trying to tell our stories, human stories. And, uh, you know, one time I asked to Steve in a masterclass that we did before, what, what is producing for you? And, and you said yourself, producing is reacting to, like, like almost in it's these like Tom Hanks imaginary match and 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 it's problem solving to the core which is i have a a a ping pong match and how do i make it work right how do i find a solution which goes to exactly you know um steve um i was thinking to start this master class from from somewhere else you know before we dive into how you started filmmaking and how were you uh, how your passion drove you to to eventually this fantastic adventure everybody knows your film my my first thing was uh you know and if someone can turn down the volume of these tv would be fantastic but my first question is, you know, looking, and I go straight to the point, you know, looking at these fantastic experiences, these beautiful stories that you managed to tell the world and producing them, being there before anybody knows about it, um, of course, the passion. But what what is one of the, the experiences, one of the teaching, learning, one, one of the events, you know, one of the, the, the core moments that you bring within with you you know in the in the in the filmmaking or in the storytelling in the in the filmmaking in in the storytelling in, in both in producing in, in you know if you could sum it up almost to you know what what is producing for you what what does it mean what 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 is the the journey well you know it's you, you dig down deep and you're just finding some nugget of truth in the storytelling, you know, that somehow has an impact on yourself. And then through the entire process, you're kind of living, living through whatever that experience is that over, you know, that sort of overrides everything else because, you know, you get inundated by details on a daily basis, but there's usually a nugget of truth 
that you feel at the beginning and and it sort of overrides all the decision making so i you know if i i, I just so I usually take that with me because certain complexities that seem to overwhelm you start to fall away because you're looking at the big picture of what it is you're trying to do. And then in, in each, and, and Bob used to define every scene, what he called the red dot of the scene. And so a lot of the spectacle around the scene itself was almost for either emotional or entertainment value but they always had a point that we were trying to make at every scene that adding up those red dots created the theme of the movie and the feeling, the emotion of the film. So I think that that's kind of, you know, what I would take in starting with the whole and my feelings about that. I would look at the scene of the day or all the various scenes of the day and say, okay, what is it in this day that is contributing or adding up toward that bigger picture. And that's what I think I would take with me that I would write, because because you can't do everything, you know, you, you and so you're just, you know, trying to find that little nugget that's important. But this is beautiful because it goes back to really what, what is it's all about, which is telling the story, telling that story. And, and you know, we'll dive into problem solving and, um, you know, um, the next question will be about Castaway. That is a film that I love, you know, that how do you start, you know? Um, but but we have some students shooting in Sacramento. Some of you are here for the LRP, have been in production last week. So what is important eventually is always how do you, what is the story? How do you tell the story? And how do we focus all our energies to tell that story and make it valuable? And this is the first teaching that is very important for everybody because it's all about the story even before the Oscars, the, 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 the fame, the success of, of a picture and there couldn't be a better teaching. But yes, how do we, how, how, how do you make a film like uh, Castaway? When, when, when someone comes and, and tells you, okay, this is a script, there is one actor, there is one volleyball and uh, I want to make a scene and I know people will be, in tears, I mean, I, you know, and, and you know, because you've been working with them before, but where do you start with a film like that as a producer, when, when, when a director and when you together get, get this idea? What is the first thing that? The very first thing, the very first thing you do, gosh, you know, you know, this, this, this script actually came um, from Tom Hanks. He was developing the story with the writer, Bill Broyles. Um, Bill Broyles went and spent time on a, I think it was a, it may have been off of Mexico, I'm not sure, but he spent time on an island, first of all, to get the feeling of what it would like to be. And he stayed there for quite a while by himself. He worked with a survivalist wow. who actually did give him pointers on, you know, how to keep himself alive, but he was just left there for a week. And then a lot of the emotions that came into himself being there alone without any communication and having to learn, you didn't know anything. You know, how do you just figure out how to survive on this planet without anything? And then of course, all the emotions come in, thinking about people in your life and loved ones and loss and what everything comes in. So, so it started out, so when we got the screenplay, it was already had evolved to that stage where you know, so that's when I um, came into the project. So, of course, the first thing we had to find was, well, where is this island where this guy is going to be, you know, is going to be lost for this amount of time? And we just started, we sent a location scout everywhere. But that was the, the key, because, so I already had Tom. So, of course, that's the, the key to the movie. That's That's a good start. What we didn't have actually was an ending no one could still figure out well okay the setup works great here's this guy he's got this busy life you know he's not connecting with anybody he's he's just running here there here there everywhere he's got his roller they're trying to figure out where he's going to be for this holiday and next and then he crashes okay great now he's on this island well then what <laughs> first of all how does he get off the island 
and what's and what does that mean? So actually, they had like, I think they had written like a group of Japanese tourists or something came and 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 flocked onto this island and then said, "Hey, look, here's this emaciated guy," and they took him with them. So there were these serendipitous acts that got him off the island. What during the process of developing the material from that point was we figured it had to come from him. He had to save himself. Well, how do you do that? Well, we did what we ended up doing. He was, he just decided I'd rather try to escape this, die trying to escape this island than live the rest of my life with a friggin' volleyball. So that was the line that then we said, okay, that's catapulting our guy to toward the end of the movie. A guy who just decided that he really he wanted to live and he wanted to live so so much that he was willing to die in order to live. How did this intuition came about? So the, originally there was this group of Japanese showing up and saving him, and then what was the moment then in which in which you said, "Okay, no, this is not our end." It was just this. a moment where I don't know how it came up, but I know that it came up mm -hmm. that it was he had to save himself. Beautiful, mm -hmm. you know. So. That's what, you know, that's, so then that solved the ending of the movie because then the movie started writing itself as soon as we said, oh, okay, now he's going to save himself. So everywhere he goes, he's in this state of mind. His state of mind has changed. And then life, of course, takes its turns, you know, coming like the love of everybody thought he was dead. So then, you know, so that was so it started with, with a continuing development of the screenplay, finding the place that he was going to spend an hour in the middle of this movie surviving. And then, of course, there was this FedEx story that you, this, that you, you have to tell about, about it. I already know, but that's that's fantastic. You all remember that FedEx is everywhere. The movie starts in in Russia, right? Uh, and and that shot actually is quite interesting as well. I mean, you had to go to Russia, and then you had to go. The island was in Fiji. Where was the island? Yeah, Fiji is where we found the island where we spent most of the time filming. But yeah, we went to Moscow, and and actually, the the FedEx office in Moscow was really it didn't function very well actually. It didn't look like anything. So anyway, we staged. At that time, the Russian film industry was kind of defunct. And when they made a lot of these propaganda films, they had big stages and they were empty. So we actually redressed a the lobby of or the entry area of one of the stages to be a FedEx office. But anyway, um, so uh, how do you get FedEx into this so, into yeah, the picture? So, so Bill Broyles, who wrote the screenplay, he was an ex-Marine. And so was Fred Smith, who is the owner of FedEx. And he went and met with him. And they got along okay, but they were a little bit nervous about the fact that we were crashing a FedEx plane. 20 and, minutes into the film. And particularly the heads of marketing. They said, Fred, this is not a good idea that we're showing a crashing FedEx airplane in a movie. It's just not good promotion. It's not good for the brand. You know, so... Um, and then Bob comes to me and says, you know, we should be getting money for this. I mean, we're putting like FedEx all over the movie. They should be giving us money. They should be so thrilled that we're in it. So here I have on one side a guy whose team is telling him, don't invest in this movie or don't have your name on the movie. And another guy is saying, you should get paid for this to be in the movie. So off I went to meet Fred and the staff, <laughs> you know, in Memphis. And then before I left, I said, so Bob, do we have like a beep? Like, would UPS be okay? I mean, in, in other words, can I go to FedEx and if things are starting, you know, when you're in the middle of the heated discussion of a negotiation, do I have something in my hip pocket? I say, you know what, you guys, go take a hike. I'm going to UPS. I don't say it, but whatever. I hate UPS. Do you want my movie to be brown? I want the red, white, and blue. I want FedEx. Okay, well, so I have no negotiating, you know, power. And so the beauty of the, how the meeting, I just talked through the movie, not tried to steer a little bit clear of the plane crash and talk about the human spirit and how resilient this character was and his desire to live 
and that at the end of the movie, he was happy no matter what course he took when he reached that four corners at the end of the movie. It didn't matter. And Fred said, I think we should back this movie. And these other guys, are, we should put them in the movie. But I tell you what, here's the deal. We're not, because I asked him for money. Why? Why? He said, we're not giving you a cent. But anytime you want to ship anything on the movie, I'm giving you an account number. You can, you can ship it anywhere. And I said, can I ship stuff to Moscow? Absolutely. That's the deal. Fiji? Sure. We'll give you a plane. You just put all your equipment and we'll ship it to Fiji. But we're not giving you a cent. I said, well, that works. So <laughs> I came back and that's I said, it. I didn't get money, Bob, but I got a pretty good deal. And so that was the deal we made made with FedEx. The marketing guys were still really nervous, but um, it obviously all worked out quite well. Well, it, it is beautiful, though, to see, right? You watch a movie and then there is so much behind it. And and this is what we want from you. That's why we, we work here at San Francisco Film School to create um, the next generation of great filmmakers that have the energy, right? And the courage, but also maybe the insanity of going and and um, you know, asking for something that seems uh, impossible. What is the key though, is to understand that there is always a story behind it. And that if you pitch your story and you go to that human feelings, that relatable story, right? You can achieve something like Castaway, like Forrest Gump. To me, to understand that there was a completely different ending and then eventually, boom, you bring back to the character has to save himself. This is a journey. That's what he's in. Yeah, and I would actually go so far to say that this is one small example of using the movie to get what you want to make the movie, the film that you want to make. I mean, when you have this nugget, this thing that you really believe in, this passionate piece, I mean, it starts with casting. That's how you're going to sell. That's how you're going to get this actor involved. That's how I'm going to get FedEx involved. It, it happens every step along the way is it always falls back. We, we had, going back to Forrest Gump, we had this little sequence where we had Forrest Gump is learning once again to play ping pong. And there's a sequence of three songs and they we put in these Doors songs. The Doors were a pretty big band and, and it worked perfectly. It started slowly, it built up and built up in cadence as he was learning more and more to play ping pong. So the, we, we, we sort of, we got rejected and we didn't really, well, we didn't get rejected, but we were, the, the publishing company said, I don't think you're going to get, the Doors don't like putting songs in movies. They just don't like putting songs in movies. And, and we had a music supervisor and he says, you know what you should do? You should screen the movie for the Doors, the Living Doors. Jim Morrison had already passed away. Um, and we said, yeah, but well, the movie's not finished, but we love the movie. But so anyway, we screened it. It came back that not only can you use these three songs in the movie, but you can use as many door songs as you want. But the key to that was, is that we believed in our movie. We took the movie to, in a sense, sell our, you know, what we wanted. And that's what, you know, overcame the obstacle. And I think that would go if you're location scouting, you're at, you know, trying to get an actor. If you believe in strongly in that movie that you're making, that's your biggest tool to go out in the world and conquer the world to make the film. You know, you always rather than just, you know, you like to rely on your personality and you know, whatever and negotiating skills. But in our world, I think it's the movie, you know, that helps us get accomplished what we're trying to you know, accomplish just talking about the movie because usually that brings out all of your own personal emotions when you're... Yeah, but, you know, it's something that we say all the time, especially to students that um, decide to come to film school. You know, you have to invest not only all your money, but all your time. And if you don't have that passion, that courage, and that trust, that belief, you know, believe in your movie, then, then it will be very difficult. Although... In Forrest Gump, there is another fascinating story, right? Which is you made a deal uh, that there wouldn't have been a screening, right? A test screening for the audience. And there is a very interesting story that highlights, however, your personal, like a producer, right? With the cards and that's yelling session. What happened? What happened? I, I will, can you? 
Well, these are just stories. Wow, if you want to know story. the story, the, the, so we finally did get the movie to a, a certain, it was, it was nearly complete. We'd actually screened the movie for the studio. And despite the fact we had had a lot of run-ins throughout the making of the movie, a lot of budget issues, when the three executives came out of the screening, they were teary-eyed, really. But the head of the studio, his name was, her name was Sherry Lansing, she said, but we should still do a test screening. Okay, all right, we'll do a test screening. But everybody, I mean, the movie was pretty much done. And they loved it, but they didn't trust their own instincts. They still didn't. Okay, we'll do a test screening. And Bob and I decided we'll do a screening, but no screening cards where you give the, you know, we always think that those are sort of leading the witness. You say like, who's your favorite character? Well, they're going to name someone. Well, who's your least favorite character? Well, they might. They, anyway, we don't believe in these cards. And she said, fine, we'll just do a screening. We'll sit in the audience and we'll feel it. You can feel it when movies are working and when they're not. You really can. So we go to the screening. I bring Tom Hanks in. I seat him in the back when it's the lights have gone down so no one could see him. And then I go and get him toward the end, lead him out. And when I go in the lobby, there's the 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 entire staff from this called it was called NRG, the National Research Group. They're all in the lobby, ready to hand out cards with pencils. And I went, well, guys, there were going to need it. There's been a mistake. It's not a traditional preview. You can take your cards and go home. There are going to be no cards. And they said, well, Sherry Lansing told us to have cards. I said, she did. And they started walking into the theater. And they're handing out, you know, at the end of the aisles, they're handing out these cards. Well, I'm walk, you know, coming to the theater in the back. I said to Bob, I said, look, there's cards. I don't know what happened, you know. So I walk up to the front of the theater and said, I'm sorry, there's been a mistake. There'll be no cards today. Sherry Lansing stands up in the back of the theater in the other corner and said, keep your cards, keep your pencils. I want you to fill out the cards. I said, Sherry, there's not going to be any cards. She said, hand out the cards. We're screaming at each other across the theater with all these theater goers wondering what is good. This guy stands up in the middle of the audience and says, I don't know what you guys are arguing about. This is the best movie I've ever seen. So I go back. We said, okay do the cards, but they're all going into the trunk of my car. And so <laughs> that's how it ended up. Sherry said, fine. So they went and, and went into the trunk of my car. We looked at them. They were all as positive as we hoped. And, and then the rest was history. But, you know, it was just another fight with a studio. It's, it's another <laughs> fight with a studio, which is interesting because, you know, we try to bring in guests uh, to also understand what is working in the industry and the hierarchy that is out there in the industry and what and how it works, however, to defend our story, our vision, our films is very challenging, right? And um, films like Forrest Gump, films like Castaway are definitely a challenge and it goes back to what we were saying before though that you know sometimes it's difficult to stand up and defend your own vision but it, it shouldn't be and and that's what we try to uh promote here and try to have here right uh, don't be afraid don't don't always stand right for 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 the film that you're making for for the story that you're building uh and 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 defend it you know because they will try to put you down Everybody will, and and it's important though that um, you have that trust. But how did this all start, Steve? Like everybody is wondering, you know, when it comes to a film school, you study, you make a fantastic short film. Uh, maybe you get in a festival, maybe not. But how how did you start your career? What did you always knew you wanted to make movies? When is the moment in which you understood? And how did you even walk into these? This industry, you know. Well, I don't know if anybody looked at the it, uh, some of it's answered in the in the, the book, but you know the, the the passion for film overwhelmed me, I suppose, when I was in college. Although I didn't go to a film school, it was just going to the cinema, and particularly there was a, a film archive where I guess I I got a certain amount of my historical and international film education was they just had a film archive in the in the museum I mean, it was curated by a guy who um, really understood cinema and every every day 
he had a different film from a different part of the world or from the United States that he would screen and have the filmmakers there. And for those of us who are in cinema, when you start hearing stories or fall in love with storytelling, you know, in film, it just kind of takes a hold of you. Although I didn't know what to do with this newfound, you know, passion. I just knew it looked cool. And I liked the idea. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but I liked the transient quality of it. The fact that you just, you know, wandered around the world and doing something that, you know, I just love film and like, well, how do I get involved in that? And it just sort of, I didn't like, oh, I got to go, you know, to the USC film school. I was much more came from a hands-on type of a approach to life, I suppose, where, you know, I've done construction work or whatever. I thought, I'm just going to learn how to do something in film. I, I didn't, and I frankly didn't know the difference. I didn't know about camera. I didn't know about sound. I didn't know anything. But I thought, I'll just go down and just see what happens, go to Hollywood. You know, and so that's where I got the title of the book, The Breaking and Entering, is when I started parading around Hollywood using this production book, you know, production companies A to Z, knocking on doors and um, getting turned down everywhere until I went to snuck on the lot at Universal. I'm sort of shortened version of this, but snuck on a lot at Universal and the first place that gave me an opportunity was in the electrical department where they did set lighting. And I was so thrilled that, first of all, somebody said they would hire me. Um, and I didn't care what it was. But then as soon as you get on the on a movie set, you know, no, in whatever capacity, you just start feeling your way around and saying, wow, you know, camera actually looks kind of more interesting than lighting to me at this point. Maybe I should, how do you get in and become a loader or a second assistant cameraman? You know, how do you work your way? As it turned out, I did that for a few years and just abandoned LA. And because I had heard about these filmmakers in the Bay Area, Coppola, Lucas, and just thought, well, that just seems more in my style. Rather than fighting the Hollywood fight, I'll go up there and just see what happens. And then that's when I got hired as a production assistant at Lucasfilm and then moved into the editing room and then on and through post-production into producing. So it was a very unusual path, you know, that I ended up taking to, you know, to get, and I, everybody, all of you are going to have unique paths. I, I envied, when I was at Lucasfilm, I envied those who had gone to school because there is a camaraderie and there was a learning level, an understanding of cinema that I didn't have. I learned along the way, but they kind of came into their professional life with guys that they'd done stuff with in school. And they had learned in classes about editing and cinema, you know, cinematography and different, and and about classic cinema. And, and um, I didn't have that. And so I always kind of wished, so my, you know, that I'd gone to film school, but my film school was kind of learning as I went professionally. And I kept hopping around from different jobs until I saw, it seemed like I had an interest in everything. And this uh, producer, Frank Marshall, who was overseeing a documentary I was doing for him, he would just, while we're sitting there cutting, of course, on film, um, he would just describe his life on Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, going to this country and doing this and then scoring and music and, and all. And I said, God, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to be part of all this stuff. So after I finished the die, I said, Frank, how do I how do I get into that? And he's and he got, helped me get this uh, job as an associate producer on Amazing Stories. And so it just launched me. It took me out of a production capacity and put me up into producing for the first time, which made me nervous, by the way. I mean, very nervous, but um, because I thought I was giving up unknowingly, I thought I was giving up my creative input into a film because I was coming from editing. And to me, it put a real stamp on the movie in editing. 
because everything seemed to converge in the editing room and you're making critical decisions to help facilitate the telling of the story in the editing room. And I didn't know like producing, you can do the same thing every day, but you're managing so much, I couldn't cut through it and see the creative input of a producer, which is very, it permeates everything. You're working with every department and every decision they're making. What color should this wall be? Do you like this costume for her? Should it change when she goes to this scene or should it stay the same? Do you like the hair? Or is it too much of this? Everything, all the time, you know, you're being asked and you come to realize, I do have my hands in everything. It was just like I had hoped when I talked with Frank, I get to be part of the whole process by producing these movies. And... Um, so it kind of, I guess for me, started as in, in the technical world and, and trying to master one aspect, growing into being, you know, part of the whole thing. Which goes back though, no, it's 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 great. And you know, and you walk into a technical, uh, like, a, or electrician, right? Electrician, uh, as an, you start working as an electrician on a movie set and then you end up, um, working with and making films like Castaway, Forrest Gump, Flights, you know, Contact. Uh, but again, that's what is beautiful um, to 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 remember. I see a lot of uh, people coming to film school, and most of them they want to be director, uh, right? And instead, you know, just jumping into the world of filmmaking, where you have sound design, sound, and cinematography, and uh, costumes, makeup, there is so many opportunities there. And if you don't lose the sight of the creativity, the opportunity that you can really make in joining a team, a collaborative team, we will talk about collaboration, which I think is one of the most important things in movie making. There is where where then there is the passion, where there is the 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 engine, the real engine. And it seems is the engine that moved uh, Steve, that, you know, had, um, um, thank you to San Francisco Film School, thank you for Fred that made this connection, uh, wrote everything you have to know in this fantastic book, Breaking um, and Entering, that, uh, you know, I don't want to reveal too much because I want to uh, to now start asking you a question and then this evening, tomorrow, in the next month, start to, you know, go back and see page by page, I already read the book, it's fantastic. Uh, you want to know about uh, Roger Rabbit, who framed Roger Rabbit, another film, right, that um, he worked on. And it's a beautiful story to see how he jumped even in 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 uh, producing and working in that film. But I want to start listening to your questions. I, I guess everybody has questions. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, you have the opportunity to just raise your hands and ask, you know, what whatever you, you would like to. Yeah, let's start there in the middle. What's your name? Sure. Nelson. Great. Was there one event that, that catapulted me in? One event, like the one that stands up in the most of your time. One experience maybe that was relevant in terms of uh, producing of, uh, an important experience that um, you know you remember or a challenge. Maybe we could, you know, have a challenge, a big challenge in one of the films and how you were overcome it. Maybe we can. Well, I recounted one like of the that. more memorable experiences on four. I mean, it was it was an odd experience, but early on in that movie. Um, I, I remember I was really stopped in my tracks a couple of times on Forrest Gump, but the the beginning of the process, now you have to understand, I only produced one film before Forrest Gump. So I really was, you know, I was in, all of a sudden I'm in the big leagues and I'm just sorting it out. Most of the people I worked around had worked on multiple, multiple films. The heads of the studios were very intimidating. And I was just, feeling my way through it. So we came up with a plan to make the movie. We were gonna base it in the South. We found a great place like FedEx, I call it, or the FedEx system where he based his whole, um, he, he based his, his thesis in college on a shipping company that started with a hub and it all went out like spokes of the wheel. 
He failed at it, Stanford, but he started an incredibly successful company. Anyway, we found a location which was like that in Beaufort, South Carolina. Everything sprung out like spokes of Vietnam, shrimping, where the Forrest Gump house, where everything centered around this one town, which was very economical. So we had a great approach to the movie. Most of the deals were were outlined and I turned in a budget and the guy, the head of production, physical production at Paramount, blessed it. And we headed to the South for the last month or so of prep. And I got a phone call and they said, we want you to cut 10 million out of your budget. Now the budget was 52 million and they wanted it in the low 40s. And I said, I had prepped, although I didn't work on the movie because I jumped and started working with Zemeckis. I worked on the original plan to make Jurassic Park for Spielberg. And when I did it, the original budget that I did for him, which is in the book, <laughs> was 88 million. And he said, I won't make this picture for a penny over 59. And I was like, okay, how do I go from 88 to 50? I said, Stephen, I budgeted everything that's in. He said, just back it in, back the number in. You just tell me what I can afford for 59 million and that's the movie I want to make. I said, well, you mean just cut scenes? I mean, to me, his screenplay was sacred. You know, I, I can't like tamper with his, he said, cut scenes out, read whatever you have to do. So I went back anyway, the point of the story, which I ended up doing and came in at 59, he said, fine, and he made the movie. And then I left and made Death Becomes Her with Zemeckis. But in any case, so I knew the only, the only way to get down to the number was to just start cutting stuff out. I mean, you know, you can start trimming, go to each department and take 10% here and there, and then maybe cut a scene, but you're not gonna get to, I can get two, three, I'm not gonna get this out of this, you know? And they didn't care. They said, cut shrimping. They don't care, cut Vietnam, cut the run. The run doesn't mean anything. It's like, oh man. So I'm sitting with Bob and I said, look, this is the only way I think we can do this is we lie. We just say, instead of 76 days, we'll do the, the movie in 65 days. And I'll just stack up all the scenes on the days and eventually we're gonna start going over because it's too much. I mean, the original plan was there for a reason. That's how much I know, you know, in my little time with you, I know how much you can shoot in a day. This is what, you know, so I did. I falsified the shooting and then I just cut all the departments. You're just willy nilly, just started cutting them. If they say cut Vietnam, cut the run, I'm just cutting and who cares? Two of us can play this game. So that's what I did. I started cutting extras. I cut everything, this cut, and I got it down to the number. So certainly, so then as the movie went on, so this all leads up to, you know, the movie went on, of course, we got almost exactly back to the original number of days I had in the beginning because we stuck to the plan and we went way over budget, but we were on budget. And so all of this feeds into that first meeting I had in the when we were panning out the preview cards. This was the same woman who I was battling with <laughs> wow. through the entire movie. But so when you talk about a remarkable moment, I guess it was one when I walked in and it's like, you just bless my budget. I don't have to do anything. And then the next one was that call where it said, cut 10 million out. We don't care where you take it. Those two things were significant to me, I suppose. <laughs> well, and, and this is also the beauty of filmmaking, which is you write the creativity and film like Forrest Gump, right? That tells such an unbelievable epic story. And then the math behind that, the budget, right? When you all make your own films, you have to think about your own budget, you know, what to cut in, what to cut out. But I think that eventually this is a great learning experience, right? How and and how do we find a way? Maybe producing is also about this, right? How do we make how do we make it happen regardless? And how do we um, find uh, a a a solution that can though tell the story that we want to take? And maybe 
my next question is what is the relationship and what is in your experience the relationship between uh, you know that could be helpful for for students that are coming into the industry between a producer and a director what are the challenges and what was the challenge for you with a director such a visionary director like the make is you work uh, for most of your career and what well, is there to know that is interesting for us? Well, you know, I, I was really fortunate because I found a director to work with whose sensibilities were very much like my own. We shared the same, you know, passion for film, different kinds of film. And, and, and if, you, if you look at the gamut, most of the films that we made were selected by Bob. And I remember when there was a new agent at Creative Artists, and he sat me down once for lunch, and he said, "You yeah, look, I've just acquired Bob as a client. What kind of movies do I look for for Bob?" And I said, "I have no idea. I don't know what is going to spark his interest, but all I do know is that every time he came up with an idea for a movie, it sparked mine as well. I can't think of a time along the way where." You know, I said, oh, why did you choose that? You know, I did question that, by the way, um, since I left working with, <laughs> no, but, but anyway, so I was very fortunate. And I think it, it you know, I, I think it's just, I guess I was just so lucky. And I would think, although producing, you can hire different directors to, to do whatever it is. Like if you've developed a screenplay and you see a movie in a certain way, but when you are collaborating with the same person over and over, you feel secure because mm -hmm. of what you've been through and what his vision is, is very akin to your own. So it's just, it's a real comfort zone going in that, you know, what you imagine is not going to go all of a sudden veering off into some other place. And then you have to then come to an understanding together, you know, so, but Ultimately, I feel like the, the creative, all the creative decision-making should finally end up with the director. I just feel that. There should be a person who, not to say the collaboration doesn't go right up to that very end decision, but someone's got to march onto that set with conviction and run that crew as a director. And I think if he's not holding those cards, it makes life really difficult. You know, if I am standing around shadowing and placing any doubt, it just starts to penetrate, you know, the set where you're working. And I think you can argue all you want before you walk out onto the floor, but when you walk out onto that floor, you really want to have a strong voice and let's go and everybody is following in that, that lead. So that to me is a big distinction. And it could be that I was relying on a guy who was probably one of the genius filmmakers, <laughs> you know? So in other words, I had a lot of comfort in the fact who was taking the reins, but I still feel, you know, you can, uh, you know, it just pops into my head. People saying Bruce Willis was this is so difficult. You know, he's such a difficult, I don't know how you guys are. This is my first movie. We didn't have any difficulty with Bruce at all. And the key to that, I know, was that when Bruce raised a question, Bob had the answer. And the key, I think, to that was in the screenplay. Being a writer-director, if he asked him a question, why am I, why am I complaining about this in this scene right now? And he'd say, well, I'll tell you why. It's because in the last scene you did this, and this is where you're going, and this is why you're care. And he would... And Bruce got so much comfort in the fact this guy was guiding his role that he was an angel. He knew that, that he had control over the material. And I think that that's also key, you know, both as a producer and as a director, because that informs all your decision making and gives confidence to everyone around you. You know, you're not just willy nilly making a decision. Oh, it can be pink. It can be, oh, you can, no, go ahead, say that. That's fine. Well, it doesn't add up to his character. So you really have to, you know. So I, I think. No, this is beautiful that's, because that's, there is so much. And that's the relationship I had. 
that this is so beautiful because there is some I I thank you. This is beautiful. I really get moved in the sense that there is so much in this um answer, right? That is trust, trust, uh, working with a team, building a team, finding the persons and the people you really work best with that have your vision that can challenge you and one another, but also they are know what they're doing. They go out there and they get the job done, but in a way in which, you know, everybody knows that they taking care of their own role. And to me, what it goes back to now in this case, Robert the Make is writer, director, how important it is, however, to know who your character are, right? The character development. It's it's everything that is coming out of this conversation is not just, uh, you know, the, the, the millions, the Oscars, uh, which we all know about, but is the ending of of Castaway. That was... was and then also uh, I would say, and, and, you know, you're now working with a lot of collaborators, just speaking in collaboration, whether it's costume designer, you're talking production designer, if you're doing sound, you're talking with the sound designer, mixers. Bob can't be everywhere. My director can't be everywhere. So now behind the scenes because they need they need time they need feedback and so you're the person they're going to come to next while bob's directing he's on the floor yeah but i need a decision should i you know how do i move forward on this set how do i you know how big should this bathroom be should i place this in set dressings you know do you think that this wardrobe everybody has questions all day long for you that are creative but the more you get in sync with that director and you have this strong vision about your character and your story, I felt comfortable telling them what was, you know, giving them my opinion because I was part of this process with this director, you know, with this director, you had bonded, you know? So sure, there were times when come and said, why, why, why'd you do that? And he said, well, Steve told me it was, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I take responsibility for that. I thought it was the right, you know, but you know that's just what you got to do. But but again, go out and look for for your uh, team. Go out look for your directors. Go out look for your producers and work on that relationship that then can last for thirty years plus and and drive you to different parts of the world and making. Or if not, you, you just make a, a you okay. know you make a bonded experience for that movie that you're going out with. You know it's a connection that's made for that part of your life. But you know, you, you're connecting as strongly as I did over a long time, you have to connect that strongly on that film, you know, and it's with everyone, with the DP, because he's running all kinds of departments. You know, you better like have a clean vision ahead of time of how this movie's going to look and how you're going to shoot it, because, you know, that filters down into grips and electricians and how you build the set. We're going to shoot what wild wall we're going to have, what location when the sun's going down. I mean, you name it. You know, there's so many decisions, but it comes with everybody getting on the same page before you, you know, start shooting. But Who has another question there? Oh, so many now. Yes, please here. First um, year. No, I'm do you always say that? Do you always, <laughs> do you always say that retired airplane? No. Um, <laughs> um, what would you say to yourself for the best thing, but also the worst thing that you should be prepared for? Okay. Huh. Well, the, I guess the worst thing you'd be prepared for is, I won't call it failure, but multiple attempts to get to where you want to go. You know, be prepared that, you know, to yeah for rejection because that's going to happen it happened to me a lot you know certainly starting out and in and, and and so you know it's 15 years just to get my first job so there's a lot of rejection along the way you know and you're just navigating a path of of learning and and trying to get better prepared to not get rejected the next time so if i learn these two skill sets well maybe i can push that into there and then now that you're there you say well what if i acquire that then maybe i can get that job and you know i didn't come out with this idealism which is different when you're in school that oh i 
you know, producing is what I really wanted to do. And so now I want to go in and produce a movie. I didn't have that because I didn't have that state of mind. I just wanted to break the door down and get a job, you know. So I think you maybe have unrealistic expectations and then go, okay, so that's, I can't remember the other side of your question, but you know, that you can do is just, I think, you know, the, the biggest asset I felt like I had because I had, I had worked in so many different disciplines in film that I could talk to everybody to some degree about what they did. So I would say learning all the disciplines at least where you can converse in a in a good way is really important. If you're in the editing room and someone turns to you and says, well, do you think I should use that close up there or should I jump out wide? You can have a decision. If you're in the sound mix and you say, you know what? I think the music is actually clobbering the dialogue in this scene, we should take it down. You know, if you're on the set, all those things because you know enough about editing or sound or, cost or camera, you know, inform, it just helps you with all the filmmakers that you're collaborating with on the movie. So I guess I'd say, you know, to do that. I had to learn all that professionally, you know, as I went along. Where here you get to do it all. You know, you get your, you know, your hands on everything. And and the message goes back again, never give up. Right? That's what I, I like that it comes back from Steve again and again and again. But not in a in a you know in, in a way of you know, of course, you know, that we are just trying to convince you now, but really in a way that um that what it takes if you want to make filmmaking. So be ready, be ready because it's it's a challenge and you have to be ready for rejection, you have to be ready to uh, really learn everything new, maybe not knowing everything of every single department, but definitely knowing enough to then also build that team, which is what uh, filmmaking is all about. There is an interesting question from the people that are following us from remote, um, which, yeah, child badly, which is, of course, um, which is, is asking about the first time you were actually, um, you know, producing. How was the very first film? What do you remember? What was the very first film you were you were mentioning it before? Justice, and Justice and, and and also, I think it's interesting because it goes back to you know being a student and maybe being nervous, you know, for the first time, a sad experience. So, and I think I do believe in these. You know, making a film, it's a lot of energies. It can be very stressful. You have to take care of yourself. So, you know, especially when you come up with these gigantic budgets you know how do you also keep a balance right between you yourself steve and the steve human being the steve producer you know what what was your the very first this this goes back for the first uh experience you know how nervous were you, were you nervous you don't look well, nervous could, never, never, but. well i don't know i guess i i just sort of have this overall i there are times, you know, when I've taken it home, but I would say in general, I don't, you know, I don't, I guess I don't try to take that, you know, that part of the work um, personally, you know, that that skirmish that went on really wasn't about me. It was about, you know, it was, it was something, you know, something having to do with the film. I'm not exactly sure how to, just because everybody's got a different disposition uh, trust me, I've met a lot of other producers and they are much more stressful and stressed <laughs> than I am. I think I just have an easier, you know, I just, it's just who I cut, am. Cut so, 20 million off the budget, okay? Yeah, well, I'll do it. No, I get good that's care. what I love of Steve, you know, it's, it's but doable. But still, at the same time, I just, you know, I, I keep my smile and I just go about my day. You know, I, I don't... Um, so I guess I'm blessed with that. If you're not, well, then, you know, then you just have to go to some other kind of therapy, but. <laughs> but, but don't, don't for, I think, I think it's interesting though, because, you know, it, it becomes very stressful and you really need to also create that uh, separation, that distinction, you know, like when you are on set and when you're off set and, uh, you know, to to manage um, yourself, your your well being, whilst making a great picture, it's it's very important. And Steve cannot. 
Well, you know, on glass on, of wine. That's the well, you know, on, on death, on death becomes her. It's it's very intimidating when you like the three actors. Okay, so they're they're the people I'm working with every day. I just done one movie, and be, before that, I was behind the scenes. You know, I was working in the editing room, this associate producing, but I didn't. Unless I was doing ADR, I didn't even cross paths with actors. I certainly not in any way where I was conversing with them. You know, either about the movie, their ideas, or you know, or just getting them to do the day's work, or telling them that they had to come in tomorrow at five, even though we were finishing at ten at night. You know, the next day. The um, so that was very intimidating for me. Like with the Bruce, just Bruce Willis, Goldie Hawn, and Meryl Streep. Okay, they had a lot more mileage than this kid. Who this is my first picture. So I didn't know how to approach them on anything. I mean, even to go into Meryl Streep's dressing room and ask for like um, approvals on publicity stills. How do I do this? You know, I just go sit there and I've got like a proof sheet. And, and then she had this hairdresser she'd worked with for 15 years and he was the guardian of her trailer and and he was the one who said no Meryl you shouldn't your hair looks terrible in that because he was the hair and makeup guy and and I'm like Jesus as it turned out it's kind of actually a funny story but I go in there and I was basically kicked out of the trailer they rejected everything and I went back hanging my head I didn't know like I talked to the unit publicist and said, I don't know, you know, she doesn't want us to use any of these stills, you know? And so I waited a little while. I said, let me just take another crack at it, but give it a little extra time. And I went back and I knock on the door and the makeup guy wasn't there. So I said, this is beautiful. He's not there. That's, oh, that, that's filmmaking here, guys. I love it. Take this. notes. I love it. He's not there. Okay. And she invites me in. And she's listening to, I remember it was Astor Piazzolla. Oh so she's listening to this Astor right. Piazzolla and she says, Steve, you want to come in and dance a little bit or something? <laughs> dance? Well, okay. So I come into the trailer and we're just kind of this, this sort of, you know, I don't know if you ever heard any of his music, but it kind of wanders around in this Spanish-y influence. And so I said, oh, and by the way, I got these publicity stills. <laughs> you know, I, I <laughs> Whilst you're dancing. She said, that's not so, just put a circle. And she's circling all this stuff. And I went out and I went. So that day we were shooting the scene where she takes this potion. She takes this potion and she becomes rejuvenated as a young woman. And I thought, wait a second. So the first time I went was when she was arguing with Bruce and I put it together. This is just this actress who was in character when I came into her trailer. She was an angry bitch in the scene and she was going to be an angry bitch to me. But when she got youthified and all of a sudden her wrinkles went away and she looked beautiful and, you know, she couldn't have been sweeter. Lesson learned for the kid producer. Right? It's just like, so, but anyway, just little things, you know, that just little bumps along the way that you, now I was going, you know, I got thrown into kind of jumped past independent filmmaking right into the big leagues of people who were way beyond me. So I was navigating that field. It'll be a little different if you're, you know, working, but it's still, I think all the fundamentals are exactly the same. Yeah, and it's nice to hear that in filmmaking, there is not a truth, there is not right and wrong, but there is there is what, what there is there. and to be able to find solutions, right? And it takes what it takes. You have to dance with Marilyn Streep to get that photo practice. Okay, I'll do it next time. You can ask for me and Steve, I'll, 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 I'll come and help for sure. But, uh, you know, no, it's, it's, it's nice to know that there is not, there, there are no rules and you really have to read the situation. I think a lot of our job making films is people, people connection, being a people person and knowing how to, uh, you know, uh, to understand also what is the best move in that moment to get to get things things done, you know, and it's fascinating to hear so far that from cutting the budget from 
88 millions to 59 to getting approved, you know, for some publisher photos, you always have to read the situation and find a way to, like Steve saying, react to, produce, make the picture, make make the next goal. Who who has more questions? Yeah, here. Yeah, you first. Yeah, we do one and one one. What's your name? What's your name? Justice. I think it's it's much more the latter. You know, I, I don't remember going into a movie said, so we're going to work for a year and a half spilling our guts on something we don't believe that we actually don't think is going to, you know, be appreciated. You know, success is different. I don't really, I don't know how to gauge like success. In, it, it, success for me is when the movie that we set out to make, we make. That to me, that's success. What happens beyond that, you know, I have no idea. The, you know, are there telltale signs? I mean, there's no one judging the movie while you're making it except the filmmakers. And we believed in it at the beginning. And there's usually, there's been like, I didn't work on the original Back to the Future, but they had a different actor playing the lead role. And, you know, six weeks into the show, the editor came to Bob and said, it's just not cutting together. I think it was Eric Stoltz. And you, you should come and look at some of these scenes that I'm putting together. And he looked at it and he said, you know, you're right. And so he took it to Spielberg, who was the executive, and then they took it to the head of the studio. They shut the show down and then recast Michael J. Fox. So there, that, I guess I would call a telltale sign in the middle of something. Now, that didn't affect the screenplay didn't affect the production plan, but it was a vital element, you know, in the movie that someone threw up a flag. I suppose if someone in our collaborative group, because those are the only ones I really trust. I don't trust an outside voice telling me. I can't think of a time, you know, when the studio called up and said something that said, you know what, he's right. We really should I just don't really recall that. But there's been, you know, times where we've made shifts in the production plan or what we were thinking when ideas came from within ourselves. You know, I don't know if that answers you, you know. And, and, and then what was the second part of the question? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, was saying, I know I didn't answer the other question. Someone asked me what my, I don't know if it was my favorite film and I dodged the question because I don't really have one. But, um, but again, yeah, it's, it's the, the, the importance is also to understand that. Yeah. Right. When, whenever we do something is very important that we, we jump into something, we know what, what it is. And uh, maybe, maybe, um, you know, the follow up to that question is how do you cope with, uh, you know, you touch upon a little bit, but rejection or failure, how was it? I mean, all of the film you've done have been pretty successful, but there are moments in which, you know, there, are, there, there will be things that more than um, unsuccessful won't work the way we did. So how, what is your relationship with, uh, you know, with uh, having things not working the way you want, but also on a, on a, on a daily basis, on a, on a scene and, uh, what what can we say about this? Because I think this is a great part of being filmmaker. Well, you, you know, we usually will shoot a scene until it does work. I mean, I, 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 I right. you know, I, I don't know that we'll walk away and say, well, that didn't work. 
let's move on. It's like, what? Well, why are we moving on? It didn't work. We got to make it make it work. In terms of the the failure of films, it's usually, you know, it's a mystery. You know, we just we don't we really don't know why. I mean, you make like Welcome to Marwood, okay, <laughs> you know, based on this guy who had this traumatic situation where he had the you know his life beaten out of him. Um, when he went into a bar wearing women's shoes and left to die in the street. And then he, um, you know, through therapy, he started, you know, he built this village and, you know, outside of, yes, based on a real story, a real life story. And then someone caught and then took these photographs, these vignettes of these scenes he set up in this village. And, um, it caught the eye of a of a gallery owner, and then he became he has started selling his photographs, you know. And we thought it was um, not only a very uplifting story about a guy who overcame this tragedy, but it also had a lot of fun spectacle in it. I mm -hmm. mean, we have brought these dolls to life and all this stuff, and we thought, well, this is going to be fun. No one went to see it, <laughs> you know. But I still like the movie. I think Steve Carell did a really good job. I liked all the women who played these different doll characters and, and real life characters. And um, so I guess you just have to accept that you just made a movie that was outside the mainstream and people were looking for other kinds of movies, you know, but does that stop you from making Marwin? I mean, it, it sounded to us, it just seemed like a great combination that like Truffaut said that great cinema is a combination of truth and spectacle and i think what he meant by that is this truth this human you know this human story but also something that cinema goer you know that you want to see on the big screen you know because otherwise you can watch it on your phone whatever but he he thought it was a even though he did do movies that were didn't have spectacle in the marvelish sense they had humor or they had cinema that was compelling you know, so I think that all of our movies tend to have those, both those elements, a, a human story, but against a, a tableau that is visually entertaining. You know, we try to. Um, and, and, and this is what is important. Feel, feel, feel and trust your intuition, trust and make, make, make the film, but go full full in you know go and 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 believe and and learn from that experience and it's amazing to hear that you know uh you will learn from from anything but especially that also in that process in that story there is all of yourself i think this is what is important whenever you do something and it's it's coming up and again and again and again so who has one more question yeah here Well, so those are a lot of different questions. The, um, you know, I think working in it by yourself, like just doing it entirely on your own is the most difficult. It's a lonely experience. And for some reason, I always migrated to try to find other people in the similar situation that I was to collaborate with because it, it's sort of a support group and a learning group. So like right here, you know, you're with people, you're learning and, and struggling together. And it's more fun to struggle with people than by yourself, particularly in this medium where that's what you're going to be doing your entire life. So, you know, you'll be struggling together or collaborating, you know. So I think, you know, for me, you know, the, the advantage that I had was not was going through the training I did, it was on real films. So 
the problem that arose was something we were solving for a film that was getting made. It, you know, so I was learning with people who knew how to do that. So I had a lot of mentors. So and I was learning not to say a lot of the people who you're learning from here, they also have experience. And that's why they're teaching. They have something to offer. My teachers were professionals, you know, in the field. So I felt, you know, so the, the what I described that I wish I had been in film school because I entered into all those worlds without any knowing anyone. Where like, I don't know, George Lucas, Hal Barwood, Matt Robbins, Caleb Deschanel, you know, actually, I'm not sure where Bob Dalva went. Who Scott, did he go to SC also? But anyway, yeah, there were so many people went to, I said, God, you know, I'm like the only non-SC guy and they all know each other and they all can sit around and, and you know, talk about a screen. Will you read this script or will you watch this cut or can you look at this scene? Should I cast him? I, you know, I, they came in with all that. I grew into that, but I didn't start with it, you know. So I guess that's why I regretted it. But I cherish the fact I had mentors who taught me professionally how to do a lot of these disciplines, you know. That was one part of your question. The other part was... I think I was so excited to learn anything that I guess what made me different is I just, you know, I, I, I just had this, you know, just learning how to file trims in the editing room. Okay, so I have this piece of film and it's sitting in a trim bin. Where does it go? I didn't even know what a film strip looked like before I was doing that. And just the fact that I could put up a reel of film, watch take after take, and figure that the editor had made a selection from this scene to put in the movie, and this piece was cut off and he didn't need it anymore. That to me was a revelation. How in the hell did he choose to use that piece of that close up? The more I was in the editing room, the more I gained this understanding of the process. So I guess I just had this desire, you know. When I was an electrician, I would stand there, although I was just the guy say, hey, Steve, will you point the baby junior and put a double on it and point it down to the wall over there? I was that guy. But I watched, the. I looked at the layers of light. I studied like Vermeer paintings. I mean, I was so into lighting. I was watching every cinematographer I could and just, I want to know, what are the decisions going into lighting these movies? You know, how what makes this beautiful and, you know, so I guess I had this incredible desire to know everything about cinema that drove me endlessly. <laughs> you know, I, but it's, it's, it's the passion, it's the passion, yeah. guys. It's the passion. <laughs> and, and that's the only key and only solution that drives you to, you know, being there for hours, Vermeer, or, you know, also Martin Scorsese says, steal from the best. So, you know, there is always an opportunity. Again, filmmaking, there is no right and wrong. You have to go out there and find your team and try to, to get the best. And and uh, if though you have that passion, you have that commitment, same commitment you had when they told you cut $20 million out of this budget, eventually. But do, you think, do you think he also meant when he said steal from the best, it's like he gets in a crucial decision-making point and he's like, well, what would Scorsese do in this moment? You know what I mean? Like, I remember the end of my, mm -hmm. the first movie, Death Becomes Her, you know, um, we couldn't figure out how to end the movie. And Bob said, well, what would Kubrick do? What did he do in Dr. <laughs> Strangelove? We got to take that. We got to go through the roof. We got to have a guy like take off in a rocket ship. You know, we got to like, we got to go for it. Well, I don't think the movie did like Kubrick did <laughs> Dr. Strangelove. But the fact is, I think also he may be like when you're in this crisis and you have this bank of cinema that you're thinking on and relying on or that you revere and you say, well, what would the master have done in this situation? Mm -hmm. How would he have covered this scene? And you already kind of have images of, oh yeah, he should bring the camera in over here like he did and then punch in and just do a reverse and you're out of the scene. You right away, you have something logged in. So you're in a sense stealing from the masters you know, in order to get through, you know, a creative like crisis. 
Yeah, and, and also you may have met that too. Yeah, um, every day, <laughs> I still from you from this book. And so no, I meant Scorsese, man. Uh, no, but I think also you know there is so much out there, and it could be painting, it could be filmmaking, it could be a conversation with a person, you know, and 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 that's what what is important. I think that Steve was mentioning: keep your eyes open, uh, be passionate, and the stories are around you. You know, sometimes also we we get stuck with the story we have, we go out, we don't even listen to the story that are out there, and that's what is really important. But what is most important is that you start to work with one another, that you start to really have clear what you want to do. Uh, sometimes you jump into filmmaking and rather than being a director, you find out that you want to do sound design or that you want to do makeup or line producing and, and follow that, um, that lead. And I don't know if, if, uh, you know, you're going to find yourself in front of a trail with the uh, makeup party stuff or oh, no, what was it? The hairdresser of Mer Mer Merrily Streep that is looking at you mean and you still don't forget the face or not, but Maybe, maybe, you know, a day you'll walk also in, actually, I'm sure we'll watch fantastic films from you. But who has one more question? Um, yeah, there in the middle. Yeah, you, 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 you sorry. Yeah. Great question. Because how does the preparation change? Yeah, I'd say the, the one that completely, you know, the, the process for the start of Polar Express was, there are two things going on. One is we started with a little picture book. So, which was written by Chris von Allsberg and he painted these beautiful pastel paintings. And the story is in his book, The Polar Express. Every single, I mean, it, it had the beginning, it, it was a beautiful story, but it wasn't a movie but it was a beautiful story. And Bob decided, Tom came to us again, Mr. Hanks came to us and said, I see a movie in this, but I have no idea what to do with it. And then Bob said, I think I can turn this into a film. <laughs> so he said, he came with me and I said, so what, what are we gonna do? Are you just gonna go write this thing? And he said, no, it's, it's so visual. I think you have to go out and find me a conference table full of artists, storyboard artists, illustrators, and let's sit around and round table this movie with artists. Okay, so we get there and he said, I'm gonna write the first scene and then I want all the artists to start illustrating it and then start looking ahead and feeding me and let's just do this as a feeding process where the artists feed me and I feed the artists. So the conceptualization of turning the storybook into the movie happened with Bob and a group of hand-picked artists. The technique we wanted, we wanted to create a pastel, a live pastel painting. That was the look we were going for. And so how do you do that? So we set up a stage and said, okay, on one stage, what we'll do, we'll build a set and we'll actually dress the kid. And it's kind of like live action filmmaking with blue screen enhancements. You look out the window or you, you know, distant that you would paint, you painting some, and then we'll texturize it. <laughs> then another one, we had the two actors in wardrobe and we surrounded them entirely with a green screen, blue screen, green screen. And we'll add everything except for the actors themselves. We'll all be painted in a big animated digital thing. And then Ken Ralston, who is the head of Sony Imageworks, he said, I've got this new technology and I've seen it in some military things and I've seen it uh, helping you perfect your golf swing. <laughs> but I think there's a nugget that we can use and I wanna do a test. So we had, and he said, the beauty of this technique is Tom Hanks can play the little boy. And I said, well, how do we do that? Well, he said, well, he puts on this suit. We create this digital character in the computer. Tom does the acting and he drives the performance of the little kid in the computer. And the whole thing 
will be digitized. This whole movie will be a painting. And the beauty is the pastel painting enhancement will be organic to the frame. It won't be layered. It'll actually become textural. And so he thought, okay. So the test I remember, he ran down and he looked and he says, you know, it's the Polar Express. And there's an opening scene or opening scene when the train arrives. The trick was at that time when we did the test, you could only do the body separate from the head. And after he did the performance of his body, we put him in a barbershop chair. We put a bunch of dots on his face and he had to sit there and watch his video of him running out to the Polar Express. And he was, are you coming or aren't you? You know, oh, this is the Polar, all of that was done. And then we had to put the head on the body. It was insane. And you could only film a minute at a time. But anyway, so then we ended up <laughs> using that technique to to make the movie. So that, you know. It was huge. The budget was, it, it shot up. But the key was, is when people saw the test, they said, that's how the movie should get made. And then it's going back to the studio and saying, well, this is going to cost as much as one of your big animated movies. We're now out of live action world. We're into a big animated extravaganza and we had to reconvince the financiers to give us more money but it was based on it was the same thing happened on roger rabbit as soon as they saw the test we did a test of a little character interacting with a live action character they said that's how we have to make the movie and so it was almost the proof of concept opened up the gates more to get more financing and until that point it was on paper and most financiers don't know how to read material and make judgments. They know how to judge how many dollars are coming in and going out, but that's about it. But they don't know how to, so anyway, a short bit that helps sell the concept is what helped us move into another area to finance the film, both in the Roger case and Polar Express case. Wow, yeah. this is so exciting. Wow, but, beautiful. And, and, how are you doing? You okay? One more question. Yeah, and I can and I can actually sort of embellish a little bit. You know, things have changed over time. You know, the structure, the financial structure of those involved in movies has changed. And as I got to the last three or four pictures, the salary got reduced to virtually nothing. And the filmmakers were asked to be, you would only earn your money in success of the film. So say in the case of Welcome to Marwin with Steve Carell, I didn't, a lot of money didn't come in the bank. No money came in, basically. But you know, in some cases, and it's the same thing happened on flight. They were willing to make the movie as long as everybody worked for scale. Now, flight did make money. That's really Denzel. I mean, Denzel took that movie to a completely different level and it became a, a, a moderate success. And then everybody earned their salary, you know, because of the six. But so it's changed. I don't know. I, I didn't make movies in the streaming world. So I don't know how I think they wind it back to the older day where you just get your salary. And then whatever happens after that, which is what all this negotiation has been about. Well, wait a second. We all relied on successive films. We relied on residuals. We don't get any of that. So then, and they were paying you the same. So wait a second, guys. So you're getting all the profit. We're not getting anything. So that became, I think, a heated issue, which they settled. I don't know how that, but trust me, these guys are out to make money and they will make money despite the fact they ended the strike. And I don't know how they're gonna do it, but they will. <laughs> wow. it's, it's great but, uh, yeah because there were a couple of questions on these you know what what is the future of cinema you know if if there is a future for cinema people going and watching what do you think what is is that uh, you think and also ai now you know intervening in exactly both writing script and editing and uh, there, there were many questions about that and uh, you know so what 
what you've been for so many years in the business and of course the business now is changing the pandemic brought it to the next level so um you know what what do you see coming also i i was just the other day driving in sunset boulevard and i just saw series series everywhere like meaning cinema is dead you know it's only about tv series don't get me wrong of course everybody loves tv series but where are the filmmakers where where is cinema do you think there will be a new wave of um independent filmmakers maybe we have some of of them here or you know what what do you think are the challenges um uh, yeah it's, it's it's so hard to predict because that would be like predicting what audiences want to see mm -mm. no one knows that if you choose like a the subject matter if you pitched Forrest Gump who would want to go see that I mean really if you just you know that who knew you know who would know what movie is going to break through and everybody's going to go well wait a second what happened you know the, right I mean they're only relying on sequels and big extravaganzas Lucas, you know, Lucas isn't going to fail. Marvel isn't going to fail until it does. Now what? Are they going to make another Marvel movie just because, you know, the last one they made, you know, failed? I don't know. The, the, the tricky part is finding cinemas to play independent films. You know, with a lot of them closed down in the pandemic. Some are coming back. Um, finding an outlet, you know, and is that going to be a streaming outlet, mm -hmm. you know, for those films? I don't know. I just know the rules just keep getting broken where it keeps a lifeline going to something that people say cinema's dead. Well, it's not so dead. They're making a, all of a sudden cinemas are like revitalizing themselves when you just thought no one was going to go anymore. So I don't think it's dead. It's probably leaning toward giant spectacles are taking up the bulk of released films but i think there's still a home for the films that probably you know you'll be making um going forward or maybe they'll just be movies that are streamed which you know i don't know i think i'd still be proud of my film you know if it were streamed and, and people you know got a wide audience it's like great you know and i think it goes back really to where we start with which is the story is a meaningful story, is is a powerful story, is a story that telling us something about that character, that journey, right? Uh, that that epic um character that is talking with Wilson and it challenged it all to, you know, try to come back and then he's a stranger. So I think that I, I do agree that however it is it is the story, it is the story that that pays off. And there are so many stories out there and you have so many stories within you and we have an example of Steve that told so many story that um, is worth is worth to take the risk because it is a risk there is one last question and then we'll we'll call it a day who has one last question yeah over there <laughs> boy you know I think I'd probably if I can redirect that question to your <laughs> cinema <laughs> yeah because, you know, I never worked, you know, I worked with Aries with, with, with the Pan, you know, the Panavision digital cameras. I never worked. I don't even know. It's evolved. Like even in the last, you know, I've been making films now for four years. In that time, it's just so much, you know, that I wouldn't even know well, what's the best, least expensive, but high quality, what lenses are best on this camera or not you know that's what i don't think i'm actually the right person to but there is a very yeah, straightforward last question here that i think may be interesting which is what do you think by jacques thank you jacques um what do you think is the most important thing for a producer to know if there is anything like what is a thing that they got they gotta that that a producer gotta know that a producer is be you know, ready for fights, be yeah, ready for it. I think that to trust your instincts, you know, because um, at the end of the day, that's all you got. You know, you, the, you know it's, you, you're out there, a lot of the decision making, they're lonely decisions. And they're, you know, 
I think the the line I used in here is um, I found out what it was what it was like to be lonely at the top, and it, what it just meant is at the end of the day you're often left, and you know that decision making is left up to you and you alone. Even the director, everybody will be looking at you. So, so what should we do? And you know, in the course of some you know some problem, so I guess you know, you just have the strength, the ability eventually to um, to trust yourself um, and then be willing to suffer the consequences. <laughs> there, there couldn't thanks. be... Yeah, thanks for having me today. No, there couldn't, there couldn't be a better conclusion, really. And that's what we're trying to do at San Francisco Film School, really redirect to you, to your stories. We're here to provide you with feedback, but to just enhance your story. We learn from the master. I think uh, this was a great opportunity to just have a little introduction about what is the industry, what is filmmaking and the gift that today it's 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 following it's these fantastic breaking and entering that now you all hold in your hands because we might add a little appetizer but the full dinner has yet to come um with some italian good wine uh you know in it <laughs> no it's it's a fantastic i, I had the honor to read it last year and uh, you know this doesn't finish here uh, every single chapter has a story on a different film from uh, who framed roger rabbit to of course um those that we have named here but it's it's an opportunity um to to have such a person that introduces us to the industry don't give up follow your intuition and join us now to get your copy signed you know, on the, the only thing i'd say about the book is you know, I, I when I wrote this thing, I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to just tell the story from my point of view as I was at the time of the stories I was telling? So it's easy when you're working on Empire Strikes Back to talk about Star Wars and all your insight, everything you know about Star Wars. But I I was sitting there in a little room by myself just cranking film you know, from one rewind to the next. And those challenges that I was presenting is what I wanted to tell because that was the stage of my career at that time. That's all I knew. And so I was putting myself back. I was trying to stay out of that other world that commenting on the films that I was working on, but talk about, well, what was it that I was doing or learning while I was doing them? And that's what went into this because, you know, there's so much left out but I was left out of that. I mean, I was just a technician, you know, learning some part of a trade. So this, the, the book's kind of about that, about my experiences. And this is the perfect guide for you all, for us all, right? That want to really get into the industry, learning from the masters. And, you know, I, I trust me, every chapter has, has a piece of information that you'll carry with you in your future production. So this is really for, for filmmakers, for artists like you all are. And, and let's thank these fantastic artists that has choose to be with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you also to Fred, uh, Alex, uh, Eric, everybody that put up these fantastic um, um, uh, masterclass. Uh, thank you to all the people that join in um, uh, from, from all over the states, all over the world. We had very, very many people, 66 uh, connected, 40 here. So 100, what a success. Thank you very much. Let's join and get your copy sign on the back. Thank you again. Thank you, Steve. Can you hear me? Where's one of those cases?